get this started. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Benavia Educational Workshop Series. Uh, I'm your host, Jay Lickus. I gotta use my other hand because it's you can't see it behind a computer. Um, I'm the marketing coordinator here with Benavia, and um, I'm kind of responsible for these educational events every month. We do at least one or two every month with different topics. So hopefully you're checking out our website and uh, looking at all the great educational uh, uh, events we have coming up. Today's topic is confident caregivers caring for those with dementia. And we have two amazing CARES program experts today. And I don't say that lightly, but they you know, spend their days working in home care and memory and communications with folks with uh, dementia, different uh, phases of dementia. So we have Jennifer Owinda from Golden Heart Senior Care sitting here to my right. And I'll move the camera over there in a second. And Tony Biancardi from Neighbor Care. So thank you and welcome. Tony's on the screen there in the nice, he got the blue shirt memo, which is pretty yes. good. We're all set there. So they'll be sharing important tips and guidance on dealing with all the challenges, you know, the behaviors caused by memory loss and how to interpret some of these challenges and how to intervene in stressful situations. So um, we got an action packed hour and a half here if we need to use the whole hour and a half. Uh, we will, the presentation will work from a PowerPoint presentation and we're going to hold all our questions till the end. So if you're here, something that's exciting to you or you need more information about, um, there's a chat box. If you look at the bottom of the screen, depending on what type of system you use, but there's what's called a thought bubble and it says chat underneath it. If you click on it, you can go there and it'll open up a box and you can type in a message and I'll keep track of those in the background and have those ready when we're finished with the presentation. So that's an easy way to communicate. Uh, just a couple uh, notes, some housekeeping. Um, obviously I got everybody on mute right now, but if you want to talk, you have the, the little audio button. It looks like a microphone. You can click that off and on um, and that'll allow you to speak. But I usually keep everybody muted in respect to everybody else on the call. Uh, sometimes we get barking dogs or you know, here in surprise, we get the jets coming over from Luke. So that gets pretty loud sometimes. So if that happens, we'll, we'll, we'll mute in the background. Um, we welcome everybody to show their lovely faces. Uh, there's another button on the bottom. It says video and you can click on the video and that'll start your camera up. And uh, that way we can see your smiling face. Um, you can play with your backgrounds and show us all kinds of interesting things if you'd like. And then if you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's a view button. It has nine little, like a square of nine little buttons on it. And if you click on that, it gives you the opportunity to either watch the speaker, only the box with the speaker in it, which would be me right now, that would be your full screen. Or you can click on gallery view, which gives the screenshot of everybody that's on the call right now. So everybody that's joining us would be on your screen at the same time. So that being said, um, I'm excited to announce our great experts here. I'm going to ask both Tony and Jennifer to talk a little bit about themselves so you become friends with them right up front, give a little background of their life in the uh, senior industry, how they came to this point in their careers, and uh, why they're so excited to be here to do this and help you find folks out today. So we're going to go ladies first, if you don't mind, Tony, and I'm going to turn the camera on Jennifer and introduce Jennifer Owinda from Golden Heart Senior Care. How's that? All right. Miracle of modern technology. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jennifer Owinda. I am a senior care professional. I've been in senior care um, and a senior living for over 15 years now. It basically started um, because I had two grandparents that were diagnosed with dementia 20 years ago. And one of them had Alzheimer's that turned into, of course, dementia. The other had Parkinson's. And while visiting, caregivers would say things like, they can't do anything. And I'm like, that's my grandpa. My grandpa can do things. So I started working in senior living. And uh, as an activity director, to get people engaged and things like that. Um, after several years of doing that, I realized the need for 
education for children. So being a published author already, I decided to begin writing and illustrating educational literature about dementia specifically for children. So there could be some um, positive visits instead of, you know, grandma over here and the kids playing over there and there's no interaction. So I have written and illustrated quite a few books now, um, many of them for children. I also am became a senior uh, living manager in several states. So in the states of Oregon and Nevada and Arizona, I've managed several assisted living and memory care communities over the years. And um, well, I've done a whole lot of things, <laughs> but being a dementia trainer, I became a dementia practitioner officially a few years ago, but I've been doing dementia trainings specifically um, for about 10 years now. Um, I'm also a YouTube content creator. I do YouTube videos talking about dementia so people can better understand. A lot of times when I would go into assisted living communities to do trainings for the caregivers and staff, um, information would go in one ear and out the other because there was so much information. So I decided to break every topic up into a different YouTube video. And um, well, in my personal life, I'm a world traveler. I love gardening and I love birds. And that's that's pretty much me. <laughs> that's terrific. How, how are you gonna uh, how are you gonna be better than that, Tony? I, I was just gonna say, Jay, thanks. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> can you can you uh, work with plants and stuff while you're world traveling? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's more so in my own personal front yard. I decided to um, dig out a garden um, pond last year during the pandemic so I could have my own serenity um, place. So I have a pond and a waterfall and lots of beautiful things growing. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Mr. Uh, Tony Biancardi is the that owner. That was impressive. Thank you, Jennifer. Take care. Before I start, I'll say Jennifer is the one that developed the content and I'm kind of going off of her slide. So I appreciate what she's been able to uh, provide for me. Um, I'm Tony Biancardi, I'm the owner of Neighbor Care. Um, I think I'm a senior, especially compared to Jennifer. So I, uh, I developed Neighbor Care kind of along the same premise in that I have uh, my mother, had Alzheimer's and my, uh, she had passed two years ago and my mother-in-law passed from complications of Alzheimer's. And that was about 10 years ago. And we went through a similar situation where uh, we were having a hard time finding uh, the care. We were having um, a hard time because the, the caregivers that would come in wouldn't last. Um, and as you know, most folks are not real receptive to having care in. So once you start to develop a relationship, it becomes such a distraction to have all of a sudden that person leave an agency and have somebody else come in and go through that process again. Um, so Neighbor Care is a, a local organization. We're based just out in Sun City and Surprise, um, Western Peoria, and um, we cater more, we, we hire seniors to care for seniors. And that's kind of the premise behind our organization. Um, and uh, that's about it. It's been about four and a half years that we've been in business. And uh, we're finding that the needs in the community are now probably as, as high as they've been for, I mean, the trend's been going that way, but with the pandemic, now that we're we're seeing folks that have been sheltered and it's just um you know it's heartbreaking to see that uh, people can't get out and enjoy things that they would normally be able to enjoy um my uh when i am not working on neighbor care i've got two kids that are 13 and 11 and uh between my wife and i we have enough uh enough not trouble, but it takes a lot of our time to try and keep a, a lid on um, the two girls and going to school and all the other things that come along with uh, with raising two 
well, a teenager and an 11 year old. So that's my scoop. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and start the presentation. And I believe Jennifer is going to lead you through uh, the first set of slides. And um, if, you, if you really, really, really have a pressing question, there is a, a little reactions button at the bottom. You can raise your hand on your screen and uh, we can get to that. But otherwise, we just recommend that you uh, hold your questions till the end of the presentation. So, and bear with the PowerPoint. Sometimes these things get large and unwieldy and Jennifer will be like, change the slide and it'll just wait and wait and wait, but they do change on their own eventually. So um, just bear that in mind, that's technology we're fighting with. So I'll go ahead and get that up and running and we will move forward. Okay, perfect. Hopefully in a few seconds, you'll see the first slide come up. Tony, right. can you see that? I can't see the slide. I can just see that you're sharing a screen. Okay. Should take a few seconds to come up. Hopefully. <laughs> there you go. All right, oh, terrific. For some reason, our internet connection was unstable. I was wondering why my mouse wasn't moving. So now we got you, right? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so let's bring up the entire presentation. How does that look? That looks great. Fantastic. All right. All right. Oh. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being uh, with us today. Confident caregivers caring for those with dementia. We have several things that we're going to cover today. Um, first, we're going to take about 21 or 20 slides to understand why challenging behaviors begin uh, happen. So, of course, we are going to break up since there's so many, we're going to break up um, according to each slide, different information. That way it's not too overwhelming. Um, so understanding why ch challenging behaviors happen, um, how to address those behaviors, communication tools, and person-centered care. So there are dozens upon dozens of reasons why challenging behaviors can happen. There can be personality changes, uh, with dementia, of course, we're going to see those happen regardless. Sudden changes, though, please make sure if there is a sudden change of personality, uh, maybe someone isn't normally acting out and now they are all of a sudden, it could be an infection like a UTI or something else that is um, causing some of those behaviors. So if you see something different than what is normal, um, and I know there's not really a lot of normal anymore, but um, you'll definitely want to consult a physician to see if it's something that is treated with antibiotics. So personality changes, the apathy, um, communication problems, we see a lot of these things, unmet needs or pain, delusions, hallucinations, overstimulation, and just being overwhelmed. Uh, we're going to break up each of those different reasons um, for challenge, challenging behaviors, why they happen. And then we'll go to the next slide. Here are some more, uh, more reasons. Of course, someone who is bored to tears, it's quite possible that they're going to need some attention. Um, exhausted. If I'm, if I'm totally exhausted, then I'm asked to do something. I'm probably going to have a behavior myself. So exhaustion definitely can cause behaviors. Approach. If someone is approached um, the wrong way, that can also cause behaviors. Confusion, overall confusion, frustration, and sundowning. What exactly is sundowning? We'll get to that too. Oh, okay. We're going to actually elaborate on each one of these things. This is just a snapshot 
of the things that we're going to go over. So this is just understanding why they be ha happen, but being told no. A lot of adults don't want to hear that. Um, being told you already said that, um, or maybe they're feeling trapped or restrained, loss of autonomy, feeling unintelligent, inflexibility sometimes on the part of the person providing care, um, condescension, um, condescension, so feeling, you know, that someone's being spoken down to, arguing, bickering, that is always going to result in more challenging behaviors. Anxiety and agitation, distrust, fear, watching the news, and we're going to also go over the holidays because the holidays tend to be a lot for some people. So breaking these things down one by one, the personality changes. There are changes that are happening in the brain um, with someone who has a disease that is now progressing into dementia or if they've already been diagnosed with dementia. Those changes are going to happen. But again, it's important to note if there is a sudden change, it could be an infection that is causing that sudden change, um, those sudden behaviors. Delirium is um, something that can be reversed, whereas dementia cannot. So for that person who is dehydrated, maybe they're, or, you know, haven't, they don't, maybe their blood sugar's off or something going on. Um, you know, medically, we want to make sure that a physician is involved, that we can get down to the root of the cause if it's a sudden change of behavior. But of course, personality changes are just going to happen with dementia. Write down the triggers, though. If you notice this person always gets upset when you ask them to do a particular thing or um, if a certain person is around, you know, or a dog, I know some people are afraid of dogs that can trigger a, a, a behavior, um, whether it's negative or positive, it can, you know, cause a reaction, um, sometimes negative. So write down the triggers for future reference. It's going to be helpful for everyone involved in providing care for that person. So I kind of try to frame the, um, like apathy, I really don't care about that. So framing it from that person who has dementia from their point of view, lack of interest, that's our frontal lobe. I would encourage everyone on this pre presentation, if you haven't heard of Tifa Snow, um, she is a dementia educator. She does a lot of YouTube videos, has a lot of written material as well. A lot of her videos are very beneficial when it comes to learning about how to engage and work with people who have dementia and why things are happening the way they are. Um, that frontal lobe, though, that is our executive function. That is us, um, you know, showing interest in something or not, um, following through with a task or not, um, our personality makeup, things like that, being able to say no to the telemarketer that's trying to scam us on the phone. Um, but that apathy from the frontal lobe, a lot of times they just, I, I don't care about that topic. I got other things I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm confused and, and I want to do something else, or I don't want to even hear what you have to say. So that apathy, definitely, I've seen a lot of apathy with people who have dementia and behaviors occurring when someone is trying to get this person to do something that they really don't care about doing. Communication problems, of course, that one is your left temporal lobe. Um, if someone is having a problem finding the right words to say, expressing their needs, um, you know, if they have to go to the restroom or they're hungry or something like that, and they can't tell you, of course, that is going to potentially lead to some behaviors as well. Now, the people that we are working with are grown. These are grown people, um, seniors a lot of the time. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've worked with quite a few people who were not seniors that had different types of dementia, but that communication piece was huge. And I 
as, as they are adults, so we have to treat them as such. But I also kind of look at how my grandchildren, how their brain is coming together, how all the pieces are coming together. When they can't tell me something, they end up having behaviors. And so I'm looking at it from each angle right now, trying to gather more information on how to better interact with seniors who have dementia specifically. So all those unmet needs, you know, for that um, senior who was hot, maybe they're taking off their clothes, but we don't know why they're taking off their clothes. It's not necessarily that they're trying to do something sexually inappropriate. It could be that they're hot um, or that, you know, someone is cold, hungry, thirsty. Maybe they need um, to be cleaned. Uh, maybe they're in pain. There's quite a few medications that can cause um, stomach aches if, you know, taken on an empty stomach or um, constipation. A lot of pain medications would cause that constipation. So a person who is in pain that cannot express themselves and tell you, they, they may end up having those challenging behaviors. Tired of sitting. I don't know about you, but if I sit in a chair for, you know, three, four, five hours at a time, I'm going to get tired of sitting there. I need to get up and exercise and move around. And for that person who was in a wheelchair um, or being told sit down because we don't want you up and falling potentially, if they're getting tired of sitting, that might cause some agitation as well. Um, maybe they're sick, maybe they're dizzy. There's so many different reasons why challenging behaviors can happen. And that's why we're just kind of listing all these different ones. Delusions. Quite a few people have the delusions. Um, you stole my purse or something bad is happening outside. I just know it. We cannot tell them that's not happening. This could be even a memory that they're having from 40, 50 years ago that they are reliving. So even though we know it's not happening, trying to get them to understand our point of view is not even um, worth trying anymore. It's it's validating their feelings, what is most important. If someone is having a delusion, hey, um, you know, I know something bad is happening, or I know you're stealing from me, it's better to validate their feelings and apologize. I cannot emphasize enough on apologies. I apologized hundreds of times in the past year, just because it kind of diffuses a lot of tension. Um, but yeah, so validating their feelings, apologizing, even if it's not your fault, and uh, maybe saying, hey, I'll get some help. Uh, that could potentially help to alleviate some of the challenging behavior. Hallucinations, of course, I can't see someone's hallucination, but it is very real to that person. Some of the medications cause hallucinations. Um, we can't see it, but it's best to not say there's nothing, there's no little boy on the, the roof. No one's going to fall off the roof. That person is seeing that. Just validate their feelings. Don't lie and say, I see the boy too, <laughs> but you definitely want to validate. I'll get some help, remove them from whatever they're seeing, from whatever area that is. And um, hopefully we can redirect the conversation into something else. But those hallucinations are definitely one of the reasons why challenging behaviors can happen. And from here, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. All right. There we go. We got, um, thanks Jennifer. Two other understand, uh, challenges are overstimulation and being overwhelmed um, with overstimulation and that can be light it can be people it can be sound uh, the example i have is when my mother had some was in the late stages of dementia we had a family wedding and i remember my sister saying it would be great we've got to get mom to the venue, it'll be great for her to get out. And I said, you've got to try and think of it in terms of how she's thinking. She's going to be 
so overstimulated and taken from her comfort zone. And it's going to be hard to get her back into where she is feeling comfort. So, you know, I, I think that Jennifer brings up a great point in trying to understand where you're the person you're caring for, um, whomever has dementia, try and think of it in terms of what they're going through. And you might think from the outside, hey, this would be great, but something can be so overwhelming to somebody where you wouldn't think about that. You wouldn't think about the, the sounds or even the bright lights would be overwhelming, but it certainly can be. Um, and when you have dementia, you're, you're often embarrassed, you're afraid, you could be angry. You just, you can't do those things that you were once able to do. And that leads to just a, a myriad of emotions. Um, all right, Jay, next slide. Boredom, thinking what, you know, you, you've been, depending on your situation, you've had a life where you could do different things and had different hobbies, and now you're unable to do those things. Um, a good example that I read about was that somebody that loved to paint, and that was kind of their ability to have enjoyment, and maybe it was an ability to relax. And now because of uh, motor skills that have deteriorated, they, they can no longer paint. So how do you kind of provide that to them? Um, try and get them back to, yeah, you, you can't paint, but maybe we can go through a book on paintings and you can point out what you like or dislike or how you feel about these paintings. Maybe you can teach me uh, a little bit about the painting that you did. Um, so, so there are other ways to work in uh, when somebody is, is feeling that malaise and they're bored, you can still invoke some of those hobbies. Um, exhaustion, um, in the case of dementia, can occur later on because you're, the brain is going through um, these complex changes and relatively simple tasks. It could be talking, it could be eating, trying to understand what's going on around you. All of a sudden, those become taxing. You're putting in a lot of energy into that. And that's where you have exhaustion. You have folks that have um, more of a progression within their dementia, can take naps for a long time throughout you know, every day. Um, okay, Jay, next one. Um, this is looking at the approach. Um, how do you approach someone with dementia? And I know, Jennifer, that I think this is in a little, in a later slide, but um, one thing you just have to be aware of that um, people can be kind of spooked. You have to be slow and make sure you're deliberate. You don't want to necessarily bend over and get within their space. But if you kind of can um, more kneel down or squat down, so you're looking at them at eye level, um, you want to obviously avoid any kind of confrontational stance. Um, you want to offer your hand as opposed to grabbing or putting there, even if you were to put your hand right on the chair that they're sitting. I think you have to be deliberate and be in front of them. Um, the confusion is, is, I think that's obvious in that there's going to be so much confusion going on. Um, again, if they're out of their environment, the thinking process, um, talking too fast. If, you, if you're caring for somebody and you go in with a regular speech and you know that might be too fast make sure you're slowing down giving them one idea at a time um the frustration i mean it, it, it's almost like i put 
put yourself in their shoes and how frustrating things are. How folks that have come from different lives and different challenges and have had um, environments where they were working. I have a, uh, well, I have, we had a client that was a judge and you could just sense the frustration in him talking and trying to ask questions and the inability to do so. Um, sundowning, sundowning, I know you brought that up, Jay. Late in the day, um, where there, the confusion becomes a little bit uh, more pronounced in some cases. I was surprised to read that this happens in about 20% of those with dementia. I thought it was much higher. I thought this was, uh, the prevalence was much greater. Uh, as far as why it happens, that's still out there. There are different theories. The brain confuses daytime with night. Maybe it has to do with the light as the sun goes down. Um, but that's, that's definitely something that you'll notice in some folks where certain times of the day, later in the day, early afternoon, the confusion becomes more pronounced. Um, all right, next, being told no. Yeah, you're right. Nobody likes to be told no. Um, especially when you're used to being the one that gets to kind of dictate what is going on and now you're being told no. Um, or things like you've already said that. And I know, you know, these are things that are, are easily said, but once you're in that uh, position where somebody is repeating themselves, it's not always easy to, um, to say, no, that's not true. You've already brought that up, but there are certainly things to avoid saying. Um, something such as you're wrong. You know, if you can change the subject and redirect, um, try and avoid to say, do you remember? Instead saying, I remember when something happened. Um, don't say they passed away. That um, That's something that shouldn't be said, but it should be up to you to kind of come up with how you're going to approach that when somebody brings up a loved one or somebody that's passed. Um, I told you that it's something that should be avoided. Just repeat what you said. Um, avoid saying, let's do this, and then we're going to do that, and bringing up multiple things as opposed to saying, the next step we're going to do is this. Right now, we're going to do this task. Um, it leads to further confusion if you start adding things on. We're going to get up, we're going to go to the dining hall, and we're going to get your lunch, and then from there, we're going to go in and take a nap. If you can keep things simple, that's much easier. Um, yep, there you go. Feeling trapped and restrained. Um, there's some interesting information on a study that was done in the UK. It said about a third of uh, people with dementia feel trapped. Um, on average, dementia patients leave the house about one time a week. Now, granted, these uh, that can vary because you have obviously different levels of dementia. Um, 28% never leave their home. 44% feel like they're a burden, so they don't want to participate in other activities that are out there um, because they, they just still feel burdened. But, um, you know, those things with loss of autonomy, people that once held large positions are now feeling like they're in trap. It's always good to, and, you know, in Sun City and Surprise, there are a lot of resources available. So there are, are plenty of things to take advantage of to be able to get folks out of their home, um, at least while they have uh, the ability to really enjoy being in a different environment. 
Um, the next one is feeling unintelligent. Why can't I do this? Um, and then inflexibility. Why do we have to do it one way or another? Um, I think inflexibility is more like a refusal or a resistance. There's um, a feeling that you're being talked down to. You want to stay in control. Um, there are different ways to, to kind of phrase sentences to where you're not, um, you know, you don't tell somebody in a condescending way like Jennifer brought up earlier. Um, being talked to that way, folks lose a sense of pride. And, um, you know, it, it might be that they're saying they, I don't want to take my medication, but uh, like Jennifer said earlier, that could be, there, there could be different reasons for that. Maybe they get some kind of side effect from the medication that they have a hard time explaining really what that side effect is. Um, I know certain medications cause bad heartburn, but sometimes it's hard to really explain what's going on inside. So that inflexibility can be, again, trying to really uncover what is the real issue. Um, this is going into, uh, again, um, when you don't call me baby or honey, when you talk condescendingly, the arguing and bicker, bickering, what is really bothering them? Sometimes it's fear. You know, it could be pain, like we said, and an inability to really communicate that pain. There's the frustration, uh, anxiety. I know when my mother um had dementia that she became angrier and she was angry because she used to be the one in control and she was in control of all six of us kids and all of a sudden you lose that ability and it's got to be so frustrating and it kinda, it's going to come out differently in different people um Anger is usually in the middle stages of dementia, along with depression, and um, arguing with a, a, somebody with dementia, as you probably all know by now, is, is uh, it doesn't do anybody any good, and it usually leaves two people frustrated, more frustrated than they were before. I think the key there is really redirecting. Um, all right, anxiety and agitation. I think these are some of the things that we talked about earlier. Uh, nervous and mad, everything you say is only making me more upset. Um, anxiety can be caused. I, I know when we moved my mother, even from a different unit within her memory care facility, that move because you're in a different environment causes a lot of anxiety. If we have um, a client of ours and they go into the hospital, that's a, that change in environment causes a lot of anxiety, it just gets them out of a place where they were feeling more secure and safe. Um, as far as the distrust, I think we've all, if we've cared for somebody with dementia, have experienced some of that. I know the first client that we had accused us of stealing her false teeth, right? And you can't say that's ridiculous because in her mind, again, there's, there's gotta be you know, trust that has to be mended. And unfortunately it took a little while before she found them. So you have to have empathy and you have to be able to, um, in a lot of those cases, kind of redirect the argument. Um, and the other thing, and Jennifer brought this up, but there can be other factors that lead to these. Uh, medication changes. If you're caring for somebody and there's been a medication change, you might not think it's a medication that has a side effect of this agitation or mistrust, but these different medications, especially when you're taking so many of them, um, if you really find that somebody is exhibiting a behavior that they didn't have before, 
Again, write that down and it's always something to review because it could be a medication change. And let's see, the last one is, Jay, the next slide, there we go. Fear, something bad's going to happen. I'm scared about the future. Am I going to end up like that person over there in the wheelchair? I mean, uh, this is something that both my parents had always brought up. I don't want to end up like that. Um, you know, it's uh, always good to explain that one thing is that care today is the best it's been, right? A lot of times I think um, in my parents' case, they were looking at something that they had seen from years ago and they said, I don't wanna end up in that situation and care has really changed. Um, more the, the ability to now say, okay, somebody with dementia or memory care can benefit in, you know, if you've gotta be in a home, they can benefit from different social activities and um, having more one-on-one -on -one care. And that really wasn't available a while back. So I always like to bring up that care today is much better than it was before. And the thought that I will always be there. Somebody will always be there with you. Family member will always be there with you. Um, the television now, this was an interesting one and you might have some better insight here, Jennifer. But I, I have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of clients that like to watch old television reruns. I think it brings them back to a peaceful place. Um, and I can see where today's news, especially being that it's very negative, um, might be something that would strike fear into folks. Um, I know it strikes fear probably into all of us, let alone if you have dementia. Um, but then I, I would say if you're watching regular news um, or, or have somebody with dementia that's watching the news, it's probably best to have somebody there with them that can help with any, because otherwise I could see where anxiety would go. All right, and now Jennifer is gonna start with the next slide. So I want to elaborate a little bit more on that television and radio. Some places have the overhead speakers um, throughout, um, you know, you pick up the phone and you press a button. So some of the memory care communities, they can speak overhead. That if, if you have some confusion going on, voices coming from wherever could definitely cause some additional fear, anxiety. Um, as for the television, I know quite a few people love to watch their news, but for that person that is, you know, watching CNN or whatever, and they're talking about the war in Syria or showing images, um, negative images, to try and differentiate if that's real from unreal when you have dementia, um, it could be a problem. So last year, the, at the beginning of the global pandemic, pretty much every person on the planet, whether you had dementia or not, were in fear of some sort because um, we didn't know what to expect. All we knew was there were you know, major problems happening around the world. I can't imagine, I really, I can't imagine if I didn't understand that it's not happening right in my front yard, backyard. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't have dementia. So for them, it, it's got to be even worse to hear about COVID and Corona and all the different, you know, seeing people with the masks on and not understanding why all of these things are happening. So when we have the television on um, with negative images. Um, reruns are great. You know what? I can watch MASH. I can watch, you know, I Love Lucy. But 
for the television shows nowadays, the zombie apocalypse shows and, and things like that. It's very scary. Even if you don't have dementia, I'm not a zombie horror type film person. So those things would frighten me. Even the commercials, it's Halloween right now. And so those commercials of the scary movies, even though it's only a 30 second commercial, that's a lot of information being taken in. Uh, which leads us to our next slide. And it's talking about the holidays. Some people consider it the most wonderful time of the year, but as a dementia trainer and working with so many people who have dementia over the years, seeing their reactions to the decorate, um, decorations, the spiders and um, you know the webs and, and the vampires and monsters that we put up as decoration. It's very scary if you can't differentiate the real from the unreal. Actually, I, I read the news every morning because I want to keep up with what's going on. And this morning on the news, it was talking about a particular house that decorates their front yard in a very, very gory way. And so gory that even the neighbors have called the police on them. A graveyard, you know, in, in someone's front yard, if, if I were to not understand what Halloween is anymore and that this is just, you know, um, theme stuff for Halloween, it can be very scary. And, you know, I remember going to Kenya and being, and I don't even have dementia, and here I, I went to Kenya and it was night when I arrived at a particular village, um, a homestead that I was going to. I went to a certain compound it was dark, but I could see the silhouette of gravestones, crosses and things, you know, indicating that this is a grave. And I'm like, I'm supposed to stay here tonight. I'm sleeping here. This is a graveyard. And, and now here I'm getting a little fearful for staying at what it looks like is a graveyard. Of course, the morning came and um, the tradition is that those people in Kenya that pass away, they are buried in the compound of where they reside, uh, what, where they lived. So for someone from that country, it's probably not as scary um, if they develop dementia, but for us in this country, we're not accustomed to living um, where people have been buried. So to have graveyards in the front yard and monsters and vampires and, and limbs, broken limbs, bloody limbs and things like that laying around a front yard. It can be very, very frightening. Thanksgiving. So that overstimulation is um, that, that big plate of food. If, if I was to give someone with dementia the traditional Thanksgiving plate with the turkey and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and the, all that stuff, they would probably just get too confused. It's almost like going to a restaurant that has a hundred things on the menu, trying to determine what you want out of that hundred things. It's really hard. So too much overstimulation happens during Thanksgiving. Too many people in the house, um, just too much going on, too much holiday music. Maybe it's too loud, things like that. Um, Christmas. The flickering Christmas lights, if you've got issues, um, you know, with vision, which tends to happen with a lot of people who have dementia, then those flickering lights are going to be a problem, potentially. The life-sized animated blow-up Santa Clauses and, and deer and things like that. The nativity scene out on the front yard. Um, I remember going to a dementia presentation years ago, and I was so thankful that they brought up the nativity scene that was on um, someone's front yard, and the person suffering dementia looks out the window and says someone's trying to break in. They couldn't differentiate that this is, you know, Christmas nativity scene. It's not real people. They what they saw, it was real to them that these are people alive who are gonna try and break into our house. So being very cognizant of the decorations that we're putting up, how much we're putting up. Of course, um, Christmas, Thanksgiving, these things are traditions that we hold dear in this country. 
but if you have cognitive impairments and it's it's breaking you out of a routine routine is good but if it's breaking your routine it may cause some challenging behaviors as well the new year's eve uh, fourth of july same thing the sound of gunshots um, and bombs you know bursting in air those things can be very frightening um, whether you are a veteran with ptsd or not it can be very scary so of course we want to be cognizant of the decorations and the things like that during the holidays how to address challenging behaviors of course, every single person is different. There's different cultures, different upbringings, um, but is there a pattern to the behaviors? We're gonna wanna track if there is a pattern. Is it at a certain time of day? Is it that sundowning? Or um, is it, you know, anytime, you know, this particular thing happens? Um, journal, journal the triggers. That's only gonna be helpful for you in the future. It'll be helpful for other people as well. So how to adjust those challenging behaviors, you're going to want to maintain eye contact, let them know that you're paying attention. They're grieving for some reason, they're upset. Listen to them, make sure they know that you're paying attention to them, make eye contact. Um, be mindful of the gestures that you make. Um, your body language, that unspoken language speaks louder than words. This pointing is always bad. Whether um, a person has dementia or not, if I point, it's going to not be a good thing, right? Um, the thumbs up might be positive, but of course, in other countries, that means something else. Um, in this country, it's a, it's a good thing, but know your audience. Of course, you're working with those people who have dementia, so you want to gather as much information about each person as possible if you are um, working in a senior care facility or for a company versus if it's a loved one that you are taking care of, you probably know more information about that person. But your body language is very important. If I was sitting here like this the whole time talking to you like this, it's not very welcoming. So we want to make sure that we are welcoming, that our body language is positive, we are maintaining eye contact, they know that we are interested in learning why they're upset and how we can help. So never argue. Um, we have to maintain a calm voice, avoid talking down to them or being condescending. Um, if I, if someone is upset and I start yelling back at them, of course, it's just going to potentially cause some problems. So arguing, they're not going to be able to see it from your point of view anyways. Why try and explain yourself and argue your point? Just listen. Listen to what they're saying. Try to be, you know, very uh, understanding. Ask them, how can I help? That's a, that's a big thing. Uh, avoid confrontation. So walking right up on someone like this can be taken as threatening. Um, approaching them from their dominant side sometimes tends to be better, but when you're approaching someone, you want to make sure that they know that you're coming, that you maintain some eye contact so they know that you're about to be in their space. Um, but yeah, coming up to them straight on can be very uh, confrontational. So that's that approach. Um, typically, when I'm working with someone who has dementia, I'll approach them from the side. I'll wave. Hi, it's Jennifer. I'll extend my hand, but still have quite a bit of distance. I'll extend my hand. It's Jennifer. And then from there, we can begin a, a conversation. They know that I'm talking to them. Um, but if they are having uh, a behavior, I don't want to get into their space or I might get hit. So um, be mindful of the way that you are approaching them and of course, avoid confrontation. Consider, acknowledge and validate their feelings. Um, you're upset, you have every right to be. How can I help? Ask them if you can help them. They may tell you, how to help them or they may they may not they might not be able to express themselves in that way but you do want to acknowledge the fact that 
they're upset. Whatever they're feeling, those are genuine feelings they are having. Talking them down isn't necessarily going to work. Every person is different. Some people diffuse a lot faster than others, uh, but we have to just uh, make sure that we are validating their feelings, letting them know we are here to help, asking them, how can I help you? Use redirection and distraction. I've done this a lot <laughs> over the years. So uh, for that person that says, I wanna go home, I wanna go home, I wanna go home. Um, a particular person, I remember she, she kept saying she wanted to go home. Here I'm thinking in my mind, like an idiot, she wants to go to the place that she just left, you know, two years ago that she lived in for the past 40 years. Finally, I uh, was able to find out, ask her, where is home? She was talking about in Italy back in the 1930s. That was home for her. So it took me asking the questions first, hitting my head against a wall, um, not knowing how to uh, work with that particular person, especially since her accent was very thick uh, and often spoke in Italian because she had reverted back to the past. But I learned at, over some time, home was in Italy a long time ago when she was a child. So, I then was able to say, what did you like about home? And she started talking about gardening. Oh, well, I love gardening. And now the conversation is all about gardening. So I was able to redirect the conversation into gardening because that's what she liked to do at home in Italy when she was a child with her mother. Um, so of course, try and redirect that conversation. Um, avoid asking too many questions or giving too much information. Speak slowly and use short sentences. So I am currently learning how to speak Swahili and my husband from Kenya, born and raised, speaks it fluently. Sometimes he speaks it way too fast. I am not catching anything that he's saying. So I say he's swallowing Swahili. It's better when he is speaking to me and he's going slowly and using very short sentences, not giving too much information, I can then follow along. Now, of course, I don't have dementia, but for that person who does, if we're speaking really quickly, then how are they gonna really follow along with what we're saying? <laughs> so <laughs> slow it down. Uh, one step at a time, speaking slowly. Don't approach from behind or make sudden movements because it may be startling. If I um, sneak up on someone from behind and tap them on the shoulder, well, that's gonna, you know, make them jump a bit. It's most definitely easier to diffuse um, a situation that hasn't, you know, a, a, someone who is not agitated, it's easier to work with them than it is to someone who's just yelling out of control. So how we approach people, how we are interacting with people on an every moment basis is going to potentially agitate them, um, you know, create a behavior or prevent a behavior. So of course we wanna be cognizant of how we are approaching them making sure that we don't make too many sudden movements. It's hard for a lot of people to, to follow along with what you're going. So if I'm doing this too quickly, um, it may startle them. Step away if they become violent. This is very, very important. You don't wanna get a black eye because someone is upset. If a person is um, aggressive, uh, being violent, acting out in that type of a way, you're gonna wanna back away and maintain a safe distance. They probably need some space and time to diffuse a bit to, even if they are not doing breathing exercises, cause normally they're not, but you need to, you need to step out of the, the situation and breathe for a few moments and approach it differently. So definitely don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to have to defend yourself physically. 
how to address challenging behaviors. So depending on the person and the situation, use comforting touch. Some people don't like touch. Some people, when they're upset, they definitely don't want to be touched. So we have to be really careful who we're working with, knowing who that person is, being cognizant of their body language. Um, if they withdraw, if they pull away at all, do not reach out and keep trying to touch them. Um, I've, I've witnessed a lot of things over the years and just about everything is a training opportunity. So that person, that caregiver who reaches out to put their hand on someone's shoulder when they're upset, well, they're gonna get their hand knocked off of that shoulder or something worse. Be careful, definitely when it comes to touch. But some people really need that, that touch that, that it's gonna be okay, I'm, I'm right here for you, how can I help? Uh, so depending on the person, what the situation is, be very cognizant of their body language. Reasoning won't always work. So that frontal lobe is unfortunately deteriorating and they may not be aware of what is going on. They cannot see your point of view. I'm sure that many of you have witnessed someone getting really close up into someone else's face and not maintaining that safe distance. We have to uh, understand that their brains are not working the way that ours is. So we have to just, again, it, it just depends, every person is different, but maybe they aren't even aware of what's going on anymore. Maybe they don't understand anymore that they have dementia at that early stage people tend to be, you know, uh, I just don't understand what's going on. Why can't I remember? But then it gets to a point, normally what I've seen over the years, it gets to a point where they're not even thinking about, I can't remember anymore. Now it's, it's, it's tipped over that, that, that edge and they don't even, you know, have that ability to understand what's going on with them anymore. There's good and there's bad to that though. Patience is key. Give them some time and space. Knowing your audience is very important. Some people like to be alone more than being that social butterfly. Some people, though, they just need some peace and quiet, especially if there's been a lot going on throughout the day. Avoid lying to them. I, I know of therapeutic lying and I am myself, I'm a culprit of having to do that from time to time. Um, it really depends on the person though. Some people will become very distrustful if you, if you lie to them. For that, um, for that resident that I have lied to, um, you know, where's my husband? Where's my husband? Well, I know that that person passed away years ago, but this person with dementia, I'm not going to have them going through the grieving process all over again. I'm not going to tell them your husband died 20 years ago. There's no way I'm going to go there because that's just going to make them, you know, cry or upset. So um, some people, though, at the stage of dementia, they are, they're going to remember certain things. If I tell someone, oh yeah, um, your, your loved one is coming to pick you up later, they may remember that. And they may in their mind somewhere know that that person died years ago. Somewhere in there, they may know and become distrustful of you. There's also, um, in addition to Tifa Snow in watching her videos, Naomi Thiel is another um, dementia trainer and she's been around for, I don't know, 30 or 40, 50 years doing dementia trainings. She has a lot of information, a lot of YouTube videos. I can suggest you definitely um, search her as well. Make eye contact, call the person by name so they know, oh wait, hang on, am I on the right one here? Oh yes, okay, now we're going into communication tools. <laughs> You're going to want to, of course, make eye contact, call the person by name so they know that you're speaking to them. If I just start talking like this and, I'm, and then I say J, then you're going to perk up. But if, if I'm not making eye contact and having, um, and we're not right here together at the same time, they might not even know that you're speaking to them. 
So call the person by name, um, mind your tone of voice, ensure your voice is calm and positive and not too high pitched because some people have problems hearing that high pitched, especially if someone has a hearing loss uh, problem, then the deeper tones tend to be better for them to understand and hear. All right, and we are going to speak slowly and clearly, allow time for their brain to process each word. And that's gonna now turn it on over to Tony. Thank you, Jennifer. I wanna throw something in here real quick and then we'll go over the last two slides. I'm gonna have you take the last two. Um, I think it's good to keep in mind that you hear all these things and, and Jennifer is an expert and it's, it is, um, it's a process. It's a process to learn and to kind of adapt these things. And it doesn't mean that you don't have uh, frustrating times where, you know, you're going to blurt out something or you get into an argument. And I know that because with my kids, I have one that has, um, she has some severe ADHD and you're never supposed to argue. It's supposed to be the same kind of approach, but you get worked up in the moment and, and you're just, you're gonna go through that. So, um, you know, don't be hard on yourself if you feel like, hey, I haven't been this way or, or maybe I should have done this. It's just, it's a learning process and it takes time. And, um, you know, and hearing from Jennifer who has um, studied this and, and has it very well done. It's, it's great to, to learn from you. Um, all right, the next slide is communication tools. Uh, one step at a time instruction. I think we've, we've spoken a little bit about that. Um, you don't want to start giving multiple instructions because it's going to lead to more confusion. All right. Speak slow. This is what we're going to do next. Go through that process. And then it becomes the next step is this. Um, I think that's the, the gist of that is to take things one at a time to not put too much on the plate. I know, again, in going back to my daughter, if I say, okay, next you have to clean your room. When that's done, you got to do your homework. Then she starts to get frustrated. Same kind of thing. Uh, concise, one thing at a time. Uh, the, the body language. I think one thing that um, I was reading about, even if you're somebody that you're working with, that has dementia, if they have a smile on their face, let's, uh, you, you can't always assume that they're feeling comfortable. You still have to take the slow steps because that could be that sign of that kind of uncomfortable grin. So um, you always have to be mindful, obviously, of the body language, but don't take, the, don't take something for granted. Okay, if you see a, a, a smile, always be, going through that same process. The next one, asking the closed ended questions. There you go. Um, would you like something to drink if you make it very broad? Are you hungry? You know, I think that's when you, you want it to be more precise, especially if you can get even more specific. Would you like a sandwich? Um, as opposed to saying, do you want something to eat? Would you like some fruit? Um, the more choices, the better it is. Okay. Jay, um, positive affirmation. You're doing great. Jennifer brought that up earlier. Thank you. Anytime you can give any positive, um, any, any positive for it. Thank you. Thank you for being, um, for following what I've been asking you to do. Thank you for being so happy today. Um, you know, how are you doing? Thank you for being 
for telling me that story. That was great. I think everybody needs to hear that. Um, and, and sometimes you don't hear it enough, right? I'm on the wrong page. Um, anytime also that you can ask for help, I think that um, you know instills in them the pride. Most of these folks, as we know, have come from a life where they've been working and now they're in a situation where they feel hopeless in a way. And the smallest ask for help from them um, gives them that importance. All right, can you remind me if you like strawberries or if you like apples, anything like that? Anything to uh, have it get their input. And then Jennifer, I wanted you to take these last two. Okay, so um, the what we're going to do when I've worked with people who have dementia in the past, if I ask them, do you want to shower? No. Do you um, want to do certain, you know, care tasks? Um, do you want to do some arts and crafts? No, no, no. So I began phrasing things differently. I said, okay, this is what we're doing. Come on. And then I had a whole lot more participation that way. So I stopped asking if they want to do something. And I started saying, come on, this is what we're doing now. That helped a lot. Person-centered care. Of course, um, we are moving into a new stage of providing care to seniors. What used to be the nursing homes um, are now, you know, assisted livings and memory cares. And it's not caregiver, it's not caretaker, it's now care partner. Knowing who you're working with is extremely important in order to provide person-centered care. I like to use the example of myself because, you know, people like to talk about themselves, right? I used to wear really, really long dreadlocks uh, for 30 years, actually. And when I was doing teaching uh, presentations to staff members in different facilities, I would talk about if I am in your memory care community, I have been this in my life. I like these certain things. My hair has to be washed a certain way. You have to know who you're working with in order to provide person-centered care. For someone to just say, well, we're gonna cut off her dreadlocks because they're way too long and it's too much to take care of. That would have been really, uh, that would have stolen something away from me, right? Um, understanding that everyone has a different cultural upbringing, um, whether you were born in this country or not, say, say you're born in the United States. Well, California is a whole lot different than Tennessee, which is a whole lot different than New Hampshire. The cultures are very different according to which area that you're from. So understanding that person as a person themselves, not as all these other people who have dementia over here, knowing the things that they like and trying to allow them some joy in taking charge of their own care. That's basically what person-centered care is, allowing that person to decide, um, being flexible on our part, because we do it like this every way with every other resident I've worked with. So this is how we're gonna have to do it. Doesn't work with every single person. Um, being patient, allowing them to try to do it. Of course, we want them to maintain as much dignity, self-respect and independence as possible. Um, and let's do it together. So it's that together, we're working together as a, you know, partners, as a team versus I'm taking care of you. That person is not a child. They took care of themselves and a whole lot of people potentially all their lives. They need to, um, you know, still have that respect. They, they demand and deserve that respect. So um, did you know what I did for fun, what I liked, um, what I can do now? Do you know the things that I can do now, what I am capable of? These things have to be modified as um, the disease progresses. 
Um, do you know when I prefer to bathe and how I prefer to bathe? Some people are afraid of water. My grandmother specifically, she wasn't a person that got into the shower and had water hitting her head. She was a wash up at the sink um, or take a bath type of a person. Water hitting her head was not comfortable for her. So understanding that everyone has something different that they like, how they like to do it. That's basically your person-centered care. Um, do you understand my spiritual beliefs? So in some cultures, um, you know, the, the son or daughter cannot take care of their parent. The grandchild can. It just depends on that person, but you have to understand who that person is um, to know their cultural preferences, their spiritual beliefs. Uh, you know, if, if a person is a Jehovah's Witness, we're not going to celebrate their birthday. Um, and I know that that's hard for some people, but not for the Jehovah's Witness. And we have to be mindful of who we're working with. Um, I prefer my loved one to be here for a certain task. So um, before handling whatever um, assistance with activities of daily living, maybe their loved one, a certain person is supposed to be in the room to help provide them some comfort. And that's basically your person centered care, treating them as an equal. So these are uh, a few tips for success. We hear all the time about diet and exercise. That's the best way, right? Diet and exercise, diet and exercise. So enough movement throughout the day makes for a better night's sleep. A lot of times when people wake up in the morning fresh, there's less confusion. As the day goes on, there's more stimulation and all those things, and it can lead to that sundowning or being over emotional. But it has been proven that exercise puts people in a better mood. So mood. So everyone should be getting some physical exercise. The underrated importance of activities, socialization, and routine. Diet and exercise, yes, extremely important, but we have to have something to look forward to and to live for. Food and movement is not the only things that help us to thrive as human beings. Uh, we have to prevent that boredom, that loneliness, the depression, the hopelessness. So everyone needs something to look forward to other than meals and medications. Um, the importance of nature, fresh air, and sunlight. People who have dementia should be able to go outside and get some fresh air, just like all the rest of us. And it's, it's heartbreaking when people are cooped up in the house all the time. Uh, but going outside, getting that fresh air, that vitamin D naturally from the sun, those things help to lift our, our spirits, help us to kind of get into a better balance and harmony. So that is extremely important, getting them outside, cutting out the ca caffeine, and alcohol. Of course, caffeine is a diuretic. People who are drinking two, three, four cups of coffee every day are depleting their bodies of water. So we have to then drink way more water, but not all of us are gonna drink you know, two cups of coffee and then four glasses of water uh, to make up for depleting ourselves of that. So that caffeine, um, it can cause that agitation and, you know, the jitters and it can, it can lead to behaviors. Um, avoid excessive napping during the day. So yeah, if they're asleep all day, then they're likely going to be up all night. Changes are happening in the brain um, that end up having people sleep more in the day and be awake at night. But if you can get them engaged in activities, definitely in exercises and things like that in the daytime, you're probably going to have a better night with that person. All right, and that's just the end. Oh boy. Terrific. Tony, Jennifer, thank you so much. I know folks that was a lot of information, but it was a lot of good information. So hopefully we covered everything, but just in case we didn't, why don't we open up the floor for some questions. Make sure you uh, click on your microphone button to unmute yourself. That way we can uh, direct your questions to both our experts. So the field is open. Marty. Can you tell me some tips for traveling 
Um, my son in California wants my husband to come and see him or his family. And my husband says to me, I want to go and see my family before I die. So he really wants to go. But sometimes um, if I say, well, you know, we can't do it this way. He'll see Marty, you know, and he just yells at me. And I think it's going to be embarrassing on the airplane for him and me and other people. Um, do I attempt to do it anyhow and just trust the Lord? Or, you know, what do I do as far as traveling? All right. I can definitely chime in on some of that. Um, and Tony, of course, if you have more, please. But when it comes to getting on the airplane, let me just say it like this. Going through the TSA, even before you get to the gate, that is high anxiety. So we have to prevent <laughs> immediately, even before you get on the plane, from the minute you park that car, you're going to have thousands of people around you, which can be overstimulating, just, just a lot of noise, everybody rushing around, not necessarily the best thing for someone with um, advanced dementia. But of course, every person is different. Some people are just chill and no problem, and then others may get you know, excited. I, if I were you and I was going to get on an airplane, I would probably have a bunch of little cards made up that says, I'm traveling with this person's name. Um, I would also have a name tag on that person. That person should have a name tag on because people will need to then address that person. Know that that little name card that says Marty has dementia confusion, you know, some of those things, little, little bullet points, likes, um, cookies, likes, you know, singing songs, thing, whatever. Um, it has to be tailored specific to that person, of course, but you can hand that to the person at the TSA before you even get to putting everything on that conveyor belt and all of that. The person who is checking your ID and your ticket I would give them that card and say, um, you know, I, I need you to pass this along. So that way, th before you even get towards emptying out the laptop and taking off your shoes and all that stuff, um, at least the people there that are scanning people don't try and frisk your loved one. Because if he comes through, they may have to pat him down somewhere and then it could potentially be a problem. But I'd have a bunch of those cards I would hand those to anyone that you are coming in contact with, the person that is at the gate, um, the stewardess, I'm sorry, flight attendants, still back in the days, right? Um, the flight attendants, I would hand them that as well. I would also have some um, things that they could potentially do while they're on the airplane. And even the people around you might need one of those little cards so they don't get agitated when your loved one decides to take off his mask. Things like that could be a problem nowadays with COVID, right? We see a lot of stuff going on out there. Um, it, it's gonna be challenging either way because there are so many people. It's, it's anxiety ridden for even us. So uh, definitely use those cue cards, but make sure everyone is aware, whoever you're coming in contact with, have some things that that person can do. Hopefully there's some music and he can have some earphones on. Um, speak with your physician about the Benadryl because you don't want them to get nauseous. Um, maybe some gum to chew to help with the ears popping um, once you get to a certain elevation um, and descending, things like that. Thank you. Tony, can you chime in? Yeah, that's a good question, Marty. Um, and I think a lot of it would depend on where your husband is, uh, as far as what stage. Uh, I know with my mother, it was um, it became too difficult for her to be to get on an airplane. Um, but those are that's that's a, a tough situation. Okay. Well, I, I have to. to yeah. Jennifer. 
I have to explain to my family and um, Jennifer, you've helped when talking about all the people around. I never thought of that. When we get to their home, I, you know, I said, well, you know, how many people are going to be there? You know, I think that, you know, I was reading today and they were talking about how much all the food on the table might overwhelm people. So there's lots of things to think about. So I appreciate your insight and especially those little cards. I've, they've talked about that. I've, I've heard about that. I don't have any, but uh, being specific to, to the whole group sounds good. You know, people buy you people, you know, not just to somebody after he starts yelling at them or something like that. Do it before. One of those fast pass members or whatever it's called. Yes. Where you don't have to go through TSA um, and do the online check-in that'll definitely be helpful. Okay. But also, you know, with dementia, we have to, as, as loved ones, we have to step into that person's world because they can no longer step into ours. So, you know, maybe it's um, family that's coming to visit him mm -hmm. versus him getting on an airplane and potentially having, you know, a lot of issues due to the traveling. Right. Even once you're there to go into a different bedroom and you, you know, waking up confused, uh, that's another issue that we had. Um, yeah. I know in my experience, and again, that's going to change with everybody, but uh, taking them out of their comfort zone was always something that it seemed like it took a little while to get back to that, that level. Thank you for the information, both of you. Thank you, Marty, for joining us. Uh, does anybody else have some questions for Jennifer and Tony? Eileen, I see you're unmuted. Did you have a question? You know, um, I'm unmuted. I'm Georgian, And I was going to say, I just traveled with my parents. My mom is moderate uh, Alzheimer's. And um, simply having another person was helpful. So my dad was the primary caregiver, but with me being there as well, maneuvering through the airport was easier just having an extra person. But I also wanna mention in traveling, she became very confused once we got to the new location. So I too would really wonder if the visit might be better if the sun could come to your location, if possible. I know it might not be. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, just sitting here listening to you and Tony talk about you know, the, the tips. I mean, even more so if you're going into an airport and how in just a matter of minutes, the environment can change and being able to talk through what's happening with your loved one constantly. I mean, leaving the car to go, you know, into the airport and then to check in, at the, you know, letting them know we're going to the ticket window. We're going to give them our luggage. Now we're going to go to the gate and go up an escalator. I mean, being constantly almost like a tour guide in the airport. I mean, it, it can be, I can see how frightful it could be because, you know, from the time you step into the terminal, the time you get to the boarding area, you've gone through 30 different environments. Yeah. That's uh, very scary. Any, I any just other? had a... Go oh, ahead, Marty. No, I just had a friend who traveled and she was delayed on the tarmac and she, you know, had to come back. The flight was canceled. And I said to my husband, what would you do if we had to sit there for two hours? He said, I'd sleep. Well, he might and he might not, but, you know, so... I don't know if he would or not, but I mean, I travel in a wheelchair and then he would need a wheelchair. So I told my family, I said, I can hardly take care of myself at an airport in a wheelchair. I don't know how we could do that. So I'm just giving them little tips on, you know, as I'm contemplating whether to do this and see what they have to say. So. Yeah. And I'm so, I'm so glad. Uh, I think it was Georgian who chimed in. Um, I'm so glad that you said all that you did, that you had another person there to assist because mm -hmm. if it's just you and that person who is confused and you got to go to the bathroom, 
or you, <laughs> you start getting sick, something, you just never know. You can't leave that person alone. You can't pull that person into the restroom and think they're going to be okay. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought another person along with you. Good idea. Thank you. Not to throw any doom and gloom in the conversation, but just a <laughs> week ago, um, we were a casualty of the Southwest cancellations. And what we thought was a simple trip back on a, a Sunday night turned out to be three days stranded in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I, I can oh. imagine doing that with a loved one with dementia. Yeah. I, I've also heard, and I just heard this today, that there are airlines that are going to be um, I don't know if it would be a strike, but there, it's going to cause some delays around the Thanksgiving, which is always the busiest time to travel. Right. So I, I mean, <laughs> traveling that time of year causes anxiety amongst probably all of us. Uh, let them, let alone when uh, you know you have other things to be worried about. I had friends tell me that they would take. They were leaving on th the day after Thanksgiving. And they said, why don't you let us take you to the airport when we go? I thought, well, that might work, you know, that they would take us and, but I don't, you know, lots to, lots to pray about, lots to think about. So sure. thank you though. That's true. You've all had words of wisdom. Thank you. Well, what's even better, Marty, is, you know, once this call's over, you still have two very familiar resources now and Jennifer, yeah. And Tony, that you can call and talk to. So I'm sure more Absolutely. questions will come up as it you know gets closer to the holidays. Yeah. yeah. Were there any questions on the chat? On um, the little... There was just one question in the chat box. Somebody had asked what the author's name was, and I think that was likening back to your earlier discussion. You had mentioned Tipa Snow. Oh yes. So Tipa Snow does a lot of dementia videos. Um, T e e p a and Snow like like falling snow definitely youtube search her videos she's fantastic she often comes to the phoenix area to do presentations as well i've had the chance to see her um, in person quite a few times uh, but she's just a wealth of knowledge um, it's it's very helpful you know well, can you also uh, provide naomi's last name you've mentioned her F E I L, I believe it's F E I L. Yeah. I'm gonna Google it really quickly. Naomi. <laughs> Very good. That's close. It's either F I E L or F E I L. Okay. She does also a lot of videos. Um, additionally, if 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 anyone here hasn't seen some of the videos like Alive Inside talking about the music, that is your person-centered care there, making sure that the music is tailored to each person. Because if you put you know, classical music on for someone who doesn't like classical music, it's not gonna get a good reance, uh, response. But if you put the music that they like, it can bring some clarity into their lives. So that video, Alive Inside, it was, it, 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 um, it made me cry. That's, you know, just kind of how it goes. It, it starts touching you when you see things like that. Um, from that video, I was then able to implement that with some of the residents in the senior uh, care facilities. Um, one lady was a ballerina and you put on that music and she started, she got into her world. She was in her happy place, um, but it just showed that the gentleman in that video who started talking clearly because he heard that music, it brought him out of a funk and it really, you know, it, it had him going. So I love that video. I did find it Googling. It's F-E-I-L. All right. Naomi Field. Terrific. And, and, and you had mentioned earlier, you do YouTube videos as well. I sure do. So I'm going to make sure I get Jennifer's YouTube address for her channel, and I'll post that in our, our final email that I send out to everybody as a follow-up. So you'll right. have that. Very cool. Yeah. Great. 
The best thing about YouTube is it's free. You yeah. might have to watch a, a commercial or something, but they're free educational videos. And of course, there's lots of them on how to work with challenging behaviors and how to diffuse and de-escalate. And, you know, there's so much on YouTube now. And oh my gosh, yes. it's helpful. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the field? One of, one of the, the positives of the pandemic we talked about earlier is whenever we ask a question on uh, Zoom, you have to wait, you know, right, you know, face to face, it's like, okay, I can tell there's no more questions. On Zoom, you got to wait 10 to 15 seconds because folks are trying to unmute themselves or figure out how to talk. So, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it. Uh, Marty, did you have any other words? I noticed you would, nope. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of YouTube, that's a great segue for me. Um, I just want to thank Tony and Jennifer for being here today. Tony B. and Cardi with Neighbor Care. Jennifer Owindo with Golden Heart Senior Care. Thank you so very much. Um, we have recorded this presentation. So when it's done, I will do some editing to take most of my stuff out of there and just have the good parts for you. But we will post that on the YouTube channel. Benavia has a channel strictly for their educational workshops. So you can go back and watch this at your convenience if you have questions, or you can look at any of our other educational events we've had probably in the last two years since we started posting those up. Um, I will send a follow-up email to everybody with the link for YouTube. And I, I, I beg your forgiveness, but I'm gonna throw a short, a short survey into that uh, so we can always make our presentations a little bit better every time. And if you have any comments on the speakers or what we can do in the future, please feel free to add those to it. Uh, we love learning you know, from you and learning more from our community. So um, that being said, our next educational event is going to be October 26th. Next week, we have a, a financial um, workshop on getting your affairs in order. So that's gonna be very interesting. That'll be next uh, Tuesday, I believe. 26 sounds right. And then just be on the lookout for information for our upcoming Caregiver Connect event, November 30th. That will also be a live um, uh, um, video production. With the, we're working with the city of Peoria. So it'll be live on Facebook. It'll be live on TV in Peoria and in the West Valley. And we've got some great presenters for that as well. All this information, obviously, is on our uh, Benavia website, just benavia.org. And I always end every conversation I have is if you have any questions, you don't know where to turn, or you just want to ask a question, call Benavia. We've got the resources like Tony and Jennifer and many more folks we work with that are experts out there to help you. 623-584-4999. So you've got a place to turn. With that being said, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank and you. thank you, Tony. You guys were fabulous. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Have a great afternoon and be safe. Bye. Thank you.